Connor. Yes. Really appreciate you being here. Um, before we begin the talk, a General Historical Society announcement. Um, every year, the seventh graders from Millbrook Middle School go on a walking tour uh, of the village, which is centered around the museum and the street signs. Mm -hmm. The Historical Society usually likes to have volunteers at key locations um, to go a little bit beyond what it says on the sign and you know, tell them a little bit about local history. Um, Nan and David Greenwood are the ones who organized that for years for the Historical Society. And so I have a sign-up sheet if anyone is willing to do this. The date is October 11th, right, which I think is a Wednesday. Um, and it's 10.30 in the morning until 12.15 in the afternoon. So you would just be stationed kind of near one of those Museum in the Streets markers, and small groups of students would come by every few minutes with their teachers, with chaperones, and you talk to them for a few minutes. They have questions that they're supposed to answer based on the information that's on the sign. I remember one year I did this. Normally I can't do this because I'm at work myself, um, but there was one year where I didn't have school the day they did it. And I just remember that they seemed so tired from walking like two or three blocks. <laughs> and I asked one of the kids, like, God, it's a beautiful day. You know, would you rather be like in math class taking a test? And he said, yeah, I would rather be in math class taking a test. And then I think he sat down in the middle of the road. <laughs> so if you can tolerate seventh graders <laughs> and you have some interest in local history, um, we'll pass this. Alright, so let, let's get to the topic at hand here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue this warning uh, at the beginning, and if anyone decides to suddenly get up and depart, um, we'll not hold it against you. Putting together this program, this slideshow, there's a lot of stuff, right? And it was hard to decide what to put in and what to take out. There are 114 slides. Okay. A lot of these are going to go through really quickly. Some of them are just photographs, right, or postcards. But that's a big number, I realize. So people have to leave at some point. Feel free. Um, I hope people got a chance to, to look a little bit at this family tree. Some of the people that we're going to be talking about tonight. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine when I hear a talk about history or visit a historic site. And sometimes it gets like overwhelmed by genealogy. There's like this tyranny of genealogy. And you feel like if you can't keep up with all of the names of the sisters and the nieces and everything that you're like missing out on something important. And so I'm going to try to like limit the number of names. And really we're going to focus on two people in particular. Right? Up in the upper left corner, Sarah Duncan. And over here, her daughter, Evelina, Duncan, eventually Anthony. Right? Those are going to be kind of the main protagonists in the presentation. Some of these other people will come up, right? They'll get mentioned, you'll see references to them, but keep those two names in mind. Sarah Duncan, right? Evelina, Anthony. Now, let me start before we talk a little bit about their lives and who they were and what we know about them with a story about how this came to our attention. You know, sometimes being president of a historical society, I'll get phone calls or emails out of the blue, and somebody will say, I've got this box of stuff in my attic, I'm cleaning stuff out, I'm going to throw it out, unless you guys want it. Can you come over and take a look and see if there's anything that the historical society thinks should be saved? And so a little more than a year ago, I got a call from Gordon Raspa, who's right here, and he said, can you come over to my house, take a look at this stuff? And I'd never met him before, but he ended up living like, I don't know, four or five houses away from me, something like that, right? <laughs> so it was easy to go over there. And I enlisted Ashley Lemka. Right? The two of us went to his house. And in a shed behind his house, he had four big plastic tubs filled with stuff. And so we kind of just dug in and explored. Stuff was very dirty. It was not in great condition. Um, but pretty quickly, we realized, like, this stuff is important. 
right? It was all stuff related to this black family that had lived in his house before he and his wife bought it. Um, the Duncan family, the Anthony family, right? A couple different names because of marriages. And so we said, yeah, we'll take it. And we brought it over to the archives, and we've spent more than a year now kind of sorting through it, cleaning it, trying to figure out what's there and who these people really were. You know, there were a lot of names and letters and postcards and photographs, and for the most part, we didn't really have a lot of information about this family. It's not something that we already had a file on in the archives. A lot of this material was new. And that's really the theme of this talk tonight. When you just get a donation of a whole bunch of stuff, how do you make sense of it? Right? How do you figure out who's related to who and where these people lived at certain times and what jobs they did? And you know, we looked beyond the collection a little bit, and I'll get into that in a second. But most of the information that you're going to see here, and the vast majority of the images that you're going to see here, are from that original donation, right? A little more than a year ago. Questions on any of that stuff so far? Make sense? Okay. <coughs> Slide two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is the house we're talking about. This is Gordon's house, right? You guys recognize this? This is at the end of Hearts Village Road, just before you get to 44. Um, it's kind of where that dangerous curve is with the retaining wall that people really drive around really quickly and you always think there's going to be an accident there. Right? So this is the house we're talking about. This was not in the collection, but Gordon gave me this um, to look at um, the other day, which just gives you a sense of, all right, here's the property we're talking about, right? It's got Amos Anthony's name on it. This is from 1929, right? And so we know that the family had a connection to the house at least since 1929. All right. One of the things we did when we started to figure out who this family was, what are the key names. We started looking to see if we could find information about them in other sources. And so one obvious place to look is newspapers, right? Are there references to these people um, in the Millbrook Roundtable, in the Poughkeepsie newspapers? And we found some stuff, right? There are some searchable databases for this that are available, right? Here's an image, it's a little dark, it's a little bit hard to see. From 1976, Millbrook Roundtable, Amos Anthony, right, who lived in that house, right, age 92, one of the oldest members of Lyle Memorial Federated Church. Right? So we're able to like fill in some of the gaps here. Here's just a sampling of some of the references in newspapers to members of this family. Um, Sarah Duncan, remember she's one of our protagonists, right? She's from kind of one of the older generations. I don't know if you guys can help me figure out what this means. For the life of me, I don't understand this. Little rest. I wish to inform those who reported that Ed Bradford, who had Miss E. Sutton's wheel, was stopping at my house, <laughs> that the report was a false one. Signed, Sarah F. Duncan. <laughs> Little rest. Some rumor that she was trying to put a stop to, but like, has anyone ever heard that expression, who had Miss E. Sutton's wheel? <laughs> I don't know. So that's kind of a mystery to me. It's interesting. There's kind of banal ones, right? We wish to thank the Millbrook Fire Company for being so kind to distinguish the chimney fire for us, Mr. and Mrs. Amos Anthony, right? So that's a reference to the house that we were just looking at. Um, Amos Anthony has a new five-passenger Ford automobile, right? That's from the 1910s, right? So that's pretty early for someone to have right, an automobile. It's before, you know, they become more common in the 1920s. So I think we could draw some conclusions based on that. Um, this is my favorite one. On the right, um, let me just read a couple sentences here. Miss Marion Johnson was the guest of honor at a linen shower given by Miss Eliza Britton at her home in Millbrook on Thursday evening, June 24th. She was the recipient of many beautiful gifts which were arranged in a decorated clothes basket, the color scheme being carried out in blue and pink. Games were enjoyed and buffet refreshments served during the evening. Miss Johnson will become the bride of Preston Bennett of Millbrook. Oh. 
She's a graduate of Stanford Union School, and both are graduates of Millbrook Memorial School. The guests included Mrs. Monroe Bennett, Mrs. Ernest Duncan, Mrs. Amos Anthony. So a couple people reacted to that. So who is this about? So, so Mary, who still lives in Millbrook, is 97, right? I was hoping she would be here tonight. I told her about it. Uh, but she's 97, so she gets a, a little bit of a pass. Although I'm pretty sure she could. How do you know what year that was? This is 1948. And so a little more than 75 years ago. Right? This is right before she got married. Um, I just think that's cool, right? And so here's this person who, like, we, a lot of us probably know from town, right? had a direct connection. But I'll just mention this one in the middle here. Funeral of Joseph Duncan, so that is the husband of Sarah Duncan, our protagonist, was largely attended in the M.E. Church last Saturday afternoon, the church being well-filled. Reverend J.E. Lyle spoke feelingly, right? So there's Lyle, who's a well-known figure in town, right? He eulogized uh, Joseph Duncan. The interment was at Mechanic. What does that mean? Where's Mechanic? So that's Nine Partners. Partners Cemetery, right? So here was a clue, right? What Find was it called in, in the 19th century, 18th century? Yeah, but I mean, this is from 1903, right? It's being called Mechanic in 1903. Um, and so here's a clue, right? So I could go and wander around the cemetery and look for some graves. And so I did that. Here's Joseph Duncan's grave, right? This is kind of close to Church Street, I would say in the, the front of the cemetery, like if you're, if you're on the, the, the main road there. Um, it's got his dates, right? So this is a good indication of like when people were born, when people died. Sometimes that's a little bit hard to track down, right? His wife, Sarah F. I don't know if you can read this. It says 1857 to 1913. Pay attention to that first year, 1857, because that's going to come back in a minute. I feel like she may have shaved a few years off her life at some point because she died younger. Yeah. Um, but there's a bunch of gravestones all in that same area um, from the family. Right? John Anthony and Phoebe. John Anthony and Phoebe Anthony are the same generation as Sarah Duncan and Joseph Duncan. They are the parents of Amos Anthony, who we've seen a couple references to. Phoebe Anthony, who lived quite a long time lived in Gordon's house at the end of his life, the end of her life. Um, this is hard to read. It says Bertha Duncan. Um, this is a daughter of Sarah Duncan and Joseph Duncan. And I'll just point out that she married John Britton, right? These are next to each other. It says his wife underneath her name there if you can't read it. So John Britton was the son-in-law of Sarah Duncan, I know there's a lot of names. I'm hearing myself say all these names, and like that would drive people crazy. Um, but John Britton, son-in-law of Sarah Duncan, was actually at least two years older than her, right? So her daughter married a much older man. John Britton is the one character who appears in this who we did know a lot of, about, right? Who is kind of a well-known figure in Millbrook history, because he was born into slavery in Tennessee in 1850. Right, got his freedom right, in the midst of the Civil War, came up to Millbrook, right, lived with a prominent Quaker family in Millbrook, right, and then married into this family. And so he's the one guy where like, we did know a little bit about him. Which family is that? Uh, Jarvis Condon, I think is the name. Yeah, over kind of by the Quaker meeting house, by Altamont Road over there. The house that he lived in is no longer there. my shoe, by the way. No. Um, here's another child of Sarah Duncan um, and Joseph Duncan, Santford Duncan. Right, here's Amos Anthony and Evelina, right, who lived in the, the house that we saw a picture of. Their children, who grew up in that house, raised in that house, Florence Anthony, Francis King, right, so you see living all the way until 2001. Their brother, um, who outlived them, um, never got married, lived his whole life, really, in Millbrook, Jack Anthony. He's not buried in Nine Partners, as far as I can tell, but he's the one who 
kind of at the end of his life, was moving out of that house right before right, you guys moved in. All right, so we looked in newspapers. We looked in the cemetery to see graves. We also looked in um, census information. Here is the 1880 federal census. Right? I highlighted the key part here. This is for the town of Washington. You might be able to see that at the top. Joseph Duncan, right? the B for black, right? M for male, age 33, farm labor. His wife, interestingly, right, is identified as Frank. That's her middle name, Franklin, Sarah F. Duncan. I don't know why that's the case, but she's identified as female, right? His wife, you can clearly see that. She's keeping house. But look at the ages here, right? So she's identified as being 27 in 1880, which means she was born in either 1852 or 1853. Remember, the gravestone said 1857, <laughs> all right? By this point, they have a daughter. The daughter's nine, right? If she had been born in 1857, she would have had her daughter when she was maybe 14. I mean, I guess that's possible, but it's a little bit more likely that she had the daughter when she was 18 or 19, right, as you see from this information here. Yeah. Daughter identified as being at school. I had no idea that there was also a New York State Census, right? But here's the New York State Census yeah. from 1892. Joseph Duncan right, C for color, right, it's got the M and the F for male and female, it's got the ages. Interestingly, I don't know how closely you were paying attention between last slide and this slide, but this is 12 years later, right, in those 12 years, Joseph Duncan has aged 11 years, and Sarah Duncan has aged 13 years. They were six <laughs> years apart, right, in the previous one, now they're four years apart. And you think, like, maybe it's different people, but it's Town of Washington, black couple, Joseph and Sarah, I mean, it's got to be them, right? It just goes to show you that, like, a lot of the census information, you know, there's, there's human error involved in this. And then jumping way ahead, this is the 1930 census. So by this point, Sarah Duncan, Joseph Duncan, they are dead, right? Their children, right? including Evelina Anthony, her husband Amos, they are very much alive. Um, they are down there at the bottom. I'll zoom in on that in a second, and you can see it. By this point, they're living in the house in question. Um, but I just want to point out on this slide, especially for the Millbrook people here, you know, when they do a census, they're pretty much going door to door. I mean, they still do the same kind of thing today, right? So you can get a sense looking at the order of names, where people are living and whose neighbor is whose. And so there's a whole bunch of safaris Right? That's a name still very much connected with Millbrook, including Roderick Saveri, head of the household, and a few Malellas, right? So they're still kind of connected to that part of Millbrook, right? Malellas still own that mill that's there. I said I'd zoom in a little bit. So you can see Amos Anthony, Evelina, their three children, Florence, Francis, Clarence, or Jack, and then the mother-in-law, right, Phoebe, who's living with them. Right? So you can see, they're four years apart still, 45 and 41. Mother-in-law is 70. Right? It mentions what jobs they're doing over here, laborer, housekeeper, right? that kind of thing. So you can get some information from this. All right. There were a ton of photographs in this donation that we got. And God bless these people. Some of the photographs had names written on the back which is what all of you should do when you get home. If you have photographs, you <laughs> write the name on the back. I know David always used to say this, right? Um, and I think this is probably true for you folks as well. The vast majority of the photographs are not of Sarah Duncan. They are of her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, right? Going up to like the 1960s, really, right? It's typical, right? People have fewer pictures of themselves than they do of their kids and grandkids. But I'm pretty sure this is her, right? She's holding right, a rolling pin, right? She worked at least certain points as a cook in people's homes. And this is the back of that photograph. It's really faint, but I have convinced myself that this says S.F. Duncan. It's a little bit hard to see in the photograph, 
But I, I think that is plausible, that that says SF Duncan. I think it lines up. And here's the other piece of evidence that I used to try to figure that out. This is a photograph from around the same time period, I'm assuming. On the back, it is labeled Marshall Children and Help. Right? This is one of the very prominent, very wealthy Millbrook families that she worked for. She's the only black person in the photograph. This is kind of this image isolated over here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's the same person as we saw on the last slide. Right? They, they look very similar to me. This is probably the first, within a few years of 1910, I would say. Right? She dies in 1913, um, in her 50s. So we'll talk more about this family, remember this family, right? Because we'll come back to them. Yeah. This is one of my favorite objects from the collection. I brought a few things, so it wasn't just photographs. We had a little show and tell element to this. This is a little metal case, inside which are maybe eight or ten business cards, basically, where her name, Sarah F. Duncan, has been written in beautiful calligraphy. Now, I'm not sure if she did that herself or if, you know, she found someone who, right, did this for a living. But to me, this really says a lot about who this person is in terms of, like, she wanted to project a sense of dignity, um, you know, kind of class, I think, like, associated with this. I think it's just a really cool object to come across. This is the oldest object in the collection, from 1868. It is a Bible. Here it is, so you can get a sense of the, the scale of it. Um, and you can see the inscription there. It's identical on both sides. It says, Miss Sarah Sanders, presented by P. Thorne, 1868, God be with you. So this is Sarah Duncan, before she got married. Um, that's her maiden name. 1868, she's either 11 or 16, depending on what name using. I'm going to say 16 is more likely. Now, I don't know who P. Thorne is. I mean, obviously, the Thorne family is very prominent in Millbrook. Around that time, there are a number of people in that family um, who are named Phoebe. Right? That's Thorne without the E, though. It is Thorne without the E. And there was a Thorne family without the That is a good catch. Except I will say that we're going to look at something later um, where Thorne is spelled that same way. I don't know if that matters or not, um, but I don't know. To me, this just raises more questions than it answers. Like, is it possible that her mother was employed by this family and there was a connection there and she knew the kids right, in that family growing up? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Date down below, it says 1867, just on Yeah, 1867 and then 1868, so I don't know. All right, some of the most interesting stuff in the collection to me were um, these little, they almost look like reporter's notebooks, kind of, or this one says autographs on it. And these belong to Sarah Duncan. They're from late 1890s, very early 1900s. And she wrote um, kind of notes about what she did during the day. They're very limited. Like, I wish she did this every day and kept track, but they're, like, so sparse. But you can get a little flavor of this, right? She signs it at the bottom, Sarah F. Duncan. I, I have a hard time reading some of this stuff, but attend the sleigh ride at Hyde Park, yeah. right? Uh, two large sleigh loads. Had a lovely time, right? So she's just kind of documenting and outing. Did. Another one, keeping track of trips to Pleasant Valley. Right? These are from 1897. Right? On the right it says, you know, worked all day and Saturday worked. Again, that gives you a sense of what her routines were like. I like this one. The rag peddler came here and stayed all night and did not pay his lodging but will pay when Pa goes to city. I love it. <laughs> right? I don't know. To me, that's just kind of like evocative of the time period. Um, but also, like, are they running their house as kind of a boarding house? Is it normal that people would 
would stay overnight, or is this a, a one-time thing? I the answer to that. Another one, right? You see the name, Sarah Duncan, 1900, 1901, although it's covered up there. This book keeps track of who she's working for and how much she's getting paid. This is fascinating to me because a lot of the people that she's working for are people we know. Like if you're familiar with Millbrook history, they're familiar names. Right? The bottom page there, it says Breeze Hill. Right? Breeze Hill is a big, fancy house, kind of on the corner of Nine Partners and 343, right? Gorgeous place, it's still there. At this time, there's a woman named Mrs. Miles Standish, right, who lived there. She's kind of a well-known figure in Millbrook at the time. And you can see, like, washing, one sheet, one shirt, right? Exactly what she's doing here. At the top of this, work for Mrs. Standish, right? So same employer as the last one. One day work, paid that amount down there at the bottom. Upper left, work for Mrs. C.C. Marshall, right? That's the photograph we saw earlier, right? She was posing with the family. Really keeping kind of detailed records of exactly how much she's working. Most of this is about her doing washing, her doing ironing, right? That's her primary um, economic function. But also cooking for the family as well, right? We saw her with that rolling pin yeah. in the photograph. So kind of adaptable. Does that say $100 off the corner? Everything that looks like it's $100 or $600 or $1,200 is $1 or $6. Yeah, she seems to be charging $1.25 or so like per day of work, which I think is fairly typical of, of cost at the time. Um, by the way, Mrs. C.C. Marshall, that family, their house is no longer here, but they lived right next to Breeze Hill, the Standish Estate. Um, on 343 on the kind of Dover so, branch so of the... So we've seen on uh, 343 when you come down. Yes, and there's actually like an old mile marker for the turnpike that's embedded into the wall there. Yeah, there's like a, a more modern house set back a little bit from the road. I'll actually show you a picture of their, their house later on. So at the top, Mrs. Thorne. Again, I don't know if that's the other Thorne family or if that's the Thorne family that we're all familiar with, but washing, you know, $1.25 a day there. Right, another one, Mrs. Thorne at the top. Where was she living at this time? In the house? In the house? No. So. Sarah Duncan never lived in their house, right? The person of her generation, Phoebe Anthony, lived in that house. She lived a lot longer. We're going to get into that question of where she lived, but I don't, I don't really have like clear, good answers to that. Um, Howard Davidson, right? He's the guy who I think was responsible for building Halcyon Hall, right? Which became the main building of, of Bennett College. Um, and look what she's washing here. Washing and ironing, I think that says sheep spreads. Washing shepherd's clothes. So people who are probably working for Davidson who need laundry services. It's a little bit different. This is my favorite one. Who is she working for here? Irish man. Irish man. Right? Anonymous Irish man who needs a lot of shirts washed. That's kind of cool. No name. By the way, I should say, yeah, he has a lot of clothes. Yeah, that's not bad for them. Um, I, I should just say, um, before we move on from this, I don't think there is a more common or typical occupation for a black woman in 1900 than doing laundry. Like, this is incredibly typical. And, I mean, there are reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is that people who did this had a lot of control over their own lives. So she is, for the most part, probably not working like as a full-time servant in someone else's house, right? She's doing this work probably at her house, on her schedule. So especially for a woman with young kids who may be at home, 
it allows you to kind of fulfill two roles at once um, and allows like a degree of autonomy uh, and kind of agency uh, at a time when that's probably not readily available to black women in a lot of other circumstances. All right, this to me is really cool. Yeah. This is Gordon's house. Um, so a couple weeks ago, you know, after I had put all this stuff together for the most part, I stopped by to you know, make sure that you guys would come and um, gave you some indication of what I had found and said, yeah, she worked as a laundress and all these people in <laughs> homes. And they said, well, when we moved into the house, there were about 20, I think you said 20, um, of these old irons that were left over and now they're displayed kind of in their house. I'm sorry this photograph is so bad, the lighting was a little tricky. Um, but you can't see it in this photograph, but there are also some that are like miniature irons, like that big, which must have been for, I don't know if I included the, <laughs> that picture. But yeah, for kind of, you know, more delicate things. So yeah, I mean, you guys have all seen these irons like this before, right? You get a sense of how hard this work is, right? Right down to, there was an old kitchen cook stove in the house. Was porcelain front, cast iron, six burners on top, hot water tank on the side, warming oven. You've probably all seen similar, similar pictures of them. And we moved it about six or eight times. Nobody ever opened up the oven. And when I finally opened up the oven to bring it to the dump for scrap iron, all these alignments were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you have any idea how heavy it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so even though Sarah Duncan never lived in this house, I mean, these must have been her irons. Um, her daughter did much of the same work. I mean, yeah. it was also a job, like if you were doing this work in your home, that you could enlist your kids to help. You know, so when Evelina is, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old, I imagine, she's probably like learning how to do this, helping her mother, um, and so would have used these irons. Yeah. yeah. She also kept track in these books, not just of where she was working, but of purchases she made. And so here's Bought of Dean Brothers, right, which is kind of the forerunner of, of Morona's. Um, bushel of potatoes, um, buckwheat, uh, gallon of molasses. That, I mean, so I made ginger snaps, you know, in honor of this, because molasses was mentioned here. But like, I made a triple recipe of ginger snaps, and it took three quarters of a cup of molasses. <laughs> Like a gallon of molasses, that's, that's serious, she wanted it. <laughs> um, bought, bought a Reardon, right, so we recognize that name. Um, a picture, yeah, dollar twenty-five. Um, a bedstead, right, six fifty. All right, this kind of goes to your question from before, right? This is in the same book. It says, Joseph and Sarah Duncan, 1902, March, came in John Britton, four rooms, M pay $4 per month, right? And then some other writing. And so I, I think this is like her paying rent to her son-in-law so that she and her husband can stay in their house. And so at least in 1902, I think, they're living with John Britton, right? He was the guy who had been enslaved in Tennessee and made it north during the war. So that gives some indication of where they were. Oh. And there's recipes, cool. right, thrown in there as well. Peach pudding, potato salad. I was tempted to try to make one of these recipes for the, but it seemed too complicated. We didn't have enough molasses. Yeah, really <laughs> <awesome. laughs> All right, so I just put this slide back in here so we can kind of catch our breath and look at some of these names that we've, we've seen. And I'll just mention, the next thing I'm going to show you um, has to do with this person here, Florence Anthony. So she is the granddaughter of Sarah Duncan, the daughter of Evelina and Anthony. She lived in that house. This is a little book that she had when she was in high school. I think these were pretty common at the time, where people would write notes on the different pages, or kind of like signing a yearbook today. So Florence Anthony, Millbrook, New York, Town, Washington, County Duchess, very thorough. Um, this is her younger brother, Jack Anthony, writing a note in 1934. Come over the hills and across the stream, you're welcome at our house of dreams. 
he Sweet. came up with that himself. <laughs> uh, this is my favorite one. Um, so I'm Alden Place, right? Margaret Bennett, dear Flossie, that's her nickname. I am writing on this page so yellow to wish you luck with your fellow. Oh. <laughs> Although I, I said I don't think she ever got married, as far as I can tell. She was, she was single. Did she have kids? Did you say? Not that one. The, her sister, oh, her sister. had sorry, kids, yeah, yeah. yeah, but she, I think, was single. This is jumping ahead a little bit in time. This is Evelina, who by this point is probably 69 or 70 years old, right? Sarah's daughter. Um, and I just included this because it says, 1958, at library, helped Jack, her son, clean window. November 13, 17, received payment from him, $9. I kind of wonder what window that is in the library. Like, you know, can we find that window? Um, but you get a sense here, too, like, this is Sarah's daughter. She's keeping track the same way her mother did of the work she's doing, how much she's charging, how much she's getting paid. Like you can see that tradition kind of being passed down from mother to daughter. Same one, she's also doing work at St. Joseph's Parsonage. Again, see how detailed this is, right? Every day, right, recorded. This is just a really cool thing that was in the collection um, that I brought and look at it. And again, like, they kept this stuff, right? So that gives you a sense of what they cared about and what was important to them. This is just a little kind of pamphlet brochure from pretty early on, maybe even like 1890s. And it's about um, a guy named E.J. Tripp, right? Possibly a relative of you back there, right? Could be. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was the guy who owned the Millbrook Hotel, which was right where the fire station is now, the hotel that was across from the train station, right? And it was a you know, bar and store and all kinds of things as well. But apparently it was pretty common for him to serve alcoholic drinks there. And this was the time when the WCTU right, opened up shop in Millbrook and the temperance movement was kind of gaining steam. And so if you read a few lines here, it says, it was in the summer of 1881 that the Women's Christian Temperance Union, at one of their business meetings, were discussing what could be done in Millbrook to cause the liquor traffic to cease. It was well known to them all that at the hotel of Mr. E.J. Tripp, liquor could always be had, and while sufficient evidence had been found against him to require that he should pay a fine, they stated that he would pay his fine and then continue to sell. <laughs> and it goes on to talk about like his conversion, right? They have um, kind of a campaign to convince him to give up the liquor traffic, and he does. And they turn it into this propaganda brochure, right? That's Millbrook specific, right? This is just about Millbrook, right? Where people would know this guy. Um, and it, it's pretty clear to me that um, Sarah Duncan and Evelina Anthony um, knew the Tripp family well. There's communication that goes back and forth between them. So clearly, like, this event was meaningful to her in some way, or the fact that she knew this family meant that she wanted to, to hold on to this. I'm guessing the Women's Christian Temperance Union, because they're the heroes of the story. Um, another thing, this is Evelina. This is from the 1940s, the Millbrook Colored Republican Club. This is something I had never heard of, right? Interesting. Um, I don't want to get too off in, like, you know, political history. Um, but in the 1930s, when FDR is president, you start to see a shift in terms of the allegiance of black voters who had traditionally been strongly Republican, right? The party of Lincoln and emancipation and reconstruction. You know, in the 1930s, you start to see some black voters, you know, come over to the Democratic Party and support Roosevelt, um, but not Evelina Anthony, right? Who in the 1940s, right, is a dues-paying member of the Millbrook Colored Republican Club. Again, you wonder, like, you know, in the best information I have, in 1912, 4% of Millbrook's population is black. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty small number, right? But the fact that this organization existed is remarkable to me, and, and printed, right, their constitution and bylaws. And kept track of who was keeping up with paying their dues. Lots of date books that they saved. This one to me is interesting because just about every month in 1947, the only thing written on the calendar is the third Sunday of each month 
they are going to an NAACP meeting. In 1964, Amos Anthony is getting an award from the NAACP for his good attendance. <laughs> I just think that's a, it's an interesting topic for an award. <laughs> good attendance. It's like a participation trophy, I guess. But. Um, all right, the next bunch of slides um, are all postcards. They kept so many postcards, huge part of the collection. I'm going to say two or 300 postcards at least. It is clear to me that Sarah Duncan and Evelina Anthony just loved collecting postcards and they encouraged their friends and relatives to send them postcards. They kept them all. They got postcards from other sources, right? They must have, right? Because they kept all this stuff. I'm just going to go really quickly through a bunch of Millbrook postcards just because there's local interest here. This doesn't really tell us that much about the family. It's just fun to look at these shots. So Quaker Meeting House, Quaker Meeting House. By the way, if you go and look at this tree today, like. It's impressive. It's <laughs> Dietrich's Lake, right? Looks very different, yeah, right? Today, much more. So that's the Hitchcock mm -hmm. property. Hitchcock. Yeah. The gatehouse at Hitchcock property again looks very oh, different today, right? Yeah. Surrounded by trees, much yeah. more open back then. Allen's Pharmacy. Yeah, Allen's Pharmacy. Where did you buy these? The Dietrich Mansion. Um, take note of the fact that the writing on this postcard is on the front. I'll mention that in a second. This is from Evelina, I think, to her mother. Thorn uh, property there, Thorndale. You guys recognize this? This still exists. This is on Nine Partners. It looks really different. It's much more kind of stripped down today. Um, but it was a, a wing house. Um, there's San Denona. So you see the house in the background. That is pretty much like where the middle school is today, roughly. The house is gone. That's still there, right? The old firehouse. Okay. There's a museum of the street sign in front of that one. Yep. Grace Church. Oh, this one's a little blurry, but I like this one. Young ladies from the Bennett School <coughs> marching through the village on the way to church. <coughs> prim and proper. Brick <coughs> Street. Gas and electric light works. That's not there anymore. That's up by like where Lyle is. Yeah, because they built it with wood. Yeah. St. Joseph's. Parsonage in the church. The old train station, obviously not there anymore. I'm pretty sure this building over here is the part of the physical therapy place. That's it's there. Bennett School. Um, this church is no longer there. This would have been down by the monument, South Millbrook. But again, you see that writing on the front of the postcard there. I think they would have attended this church at some point. Sheldon Pharmacy, yeah. Yeah, competition for right, right. Yeah. All right, this is the Charles Marshall home. This is the one I said it's no longer there, but some of the like stonework from it is still there. So this is the family that Sarah Duncan worked with, right? That was that early picture that I showed you. Um, by the way, Charles Marshall, the first thing that comes up when you search for information about him well, he was one of the founders of the Millbrook Hunt. I'm sure Peter would, would start with that. But in 1927, when Al Smith, the governor of New York, was thinking about running for president, he was Catholic, um, and there was a lot of like controversy surrounding that, he wrote a very prominent kind of open letter in um, the Atlantic magazine, basically denouncing Al Smith for his Catholicism and saying like he's got a lot of questions to answer about this. I tried to read this thing. It is dense with, like, in the weeds Catholic theology and encyclicals and stuff like that. Um, but that's, in part, what he's known for today. Uh, another view of the same house. So that would be, like, 343, right? That just turned bike. This one has nothing to do with anything. It's just a postcard of the Lusitania, like, a couple years before... <laughs> It went down. <laughs> just, that one just like caught my eye before. <coughs> just going through. And if we look at.
at the, what's on the back of the postcards, right? This gives us a sense sometimes of where they're living. Unfortunately, the post office was so efficient back then that usually it just said Sarah Duncan Millbrook, and so it doesn't really give you a clue. But here we have, right, Evelina Duncan, who's, before she's married, she's still living with her family, right? Mavitsville Road. Um, by the way, the date there, 1906, that's a key point in the history of postcards because 1906 was the last year where you had to put the address on one side of the postcard and you couldn't write anything else on that side. So those examples we saw of people writing like under the picture, that means those are like 1906 or before typically. 1907, they changed the rules where you could split the postcard in the back and put the address on half and then write a longer message on the other side. Um, by the way, with these postcards, like, you know, it pains me to say this, but these are like the equivalent of text messages. I mean, the messages that they're sending on these postcards are things like, I got your letter. <laughs> I'm going to stop by this afternoon. I mean, you could literally, at this time, because the mail was so efficient and it came so often, you could like send someone a postcard and get a response from them the same day. Right? I mean, this was almost like instant communication. So, Mavitsville Road, right? um, here's her getting mail, care of John Britton. We saw that indication in the notebook that mother was paying rent, living with John Britton. <laughs> care of Mr. Britton, you see the same thing there. Right? Now here's a little bit later, right, when we're up to kind of the housing question. That is identified as Front Street. No longer Front Street, but that's what it was back then. Or it's identified as Hearts Village, mm -hmm. right, in Millbrook. Mm -hmm. Another example of that, Hearts Village, in quotes. This is a postcard to Sarah Duncan. I don't know why part of it is upside down and part of it's going the other way, but this is from Evelina Tripp. Remember Tripp was the name for that pamphlet? Right? And so they clearly knew each other. And so here she is sending a postcard to Sarah Duncan. Will you and will you and can you come to keep house and store for mother this Saturday? Right? So some indication of like the business relationships that existed, of like what kind of work she was doing. This is a year before she dies, in 1913. And I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but like it seems that there's a lot of repeating of names among like the white families that she's associated with and working for and her own family. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if she's like naming her children after children of her employers and stuff like that. Another one from Tripp. This one just says, hey, we're in Woods Hole, Massachusetts and guess who we ran into? Mr. and Mrs. Frank Swift of Millbrook. This is Mrs. Evelina Campbell. Yes. This one was personally important to me because the signature there is it says Charles Johnson. I think that's Charlie Johnson who died in the in the Korean War. Like we make a big deal of Charlie Johnson where, where I teach. There's an award that's given out in his name. So this is 1939. He would have been like seven. I feel like this could be a seven-year-old, right, who wrote this. And so I don't know how they knew each other, but right, being sent to Mrs. Mrs. Anthony. Mr. and Mrs. Amy. From your old sweetheart. That's the whole message. Um, here's just an example of, this is a postcard sent to someone else, right? A student at the Bennett School. Somehow it comes into the family's possession. Right? So clearly they liked postcards, they liked collecting these things, and like other people knew that, and when they had a postcard, they gave them to them. Same thing, right? Different student, Bennett School, right? except for Berkeley, California. All right, this is an indication of some of the employers, right? Sarah Duncan. By the way, right? the date up there in the upper left, 1906, even if there was no date, we could guess that this was 1906, right? Because it's got the writing on the front. It says, Dear Sarah, our hotel is on this lake, right? St. Moritz in Switzerland. It's very beautiful here, 6,000 feet above sea level. Best wishes to you all. Keep well. Mrs. Schlapp. Now, I have no idea who that was. That was not a name that I had heard of. But I'm pretty sure that there is a Dr. Schlapp, who I'm going to assume is Mrs. Schlapp's husband, um, who was the house doctor at the Halcyon Hotel. 
and when it closed, went on to another job in New York City as the head of the Institute for Mental Defectives. That's the actual name of it. <laughs> so again, people who probably weren't in Millbrook that long kind of came and went, but knew Sarah Duncan. Um, other people she worked for, right? She's getting mail at these people's homes. Right? And so at least at some point, she's not just like doing laundry at her house, she's actually living with her employers. Thomas Foley at one point was a constable in Millbrook. Another one, Thomas Foley. Right? These are like often her grandkids sending her postcards, right? You can see the writing there. This one, I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, right? But this is an employer, Mrs. Gilbert. Charles Gilbert, her husband, was the pastor of Grace Church. He's the guy who built the parish house, right, behind the church. He was pastor in the early 1900s. He says, uh, we shall uh, not get home until next Thursday, September 8th. Um, can you come to me Saturday morning, write us in Millbrook, or let me know when I get home? That will do. Mrs. Gilbert. To me, when I read this, like, you know, like, it was like a little chilling, like that last line, that will do. Like, there's kind of a coldness to that, like, you know, between employer and employee. All right, another one, Charles Gilbert, right? This is him getting the postcard, right? So, again, this is coming into her collection somehow. Another one, right, Gilbert? Mm. Here's Charles Marshall, right? So that's that employer we keep talking about, which had been sent to his home in New York City, 137 East 62nd Street, right? Then redirected again. Sarah Duncan comes to own this. There's that picture that I showed you before, right? Remind you about this family. Oh, I love this one. Master Rufus Marshall, right? So this is one of the children in that photograph. Possible if I've done the math correctly that he's about three when he's receiving this postcard. He's getting this from his friend. Dear Rufus, there is a hunter coming to you from Carl. It's so ominous. Like, I, I love that. There's a hunter coming to you. But again, it, like Sarah Duncan gets this postcard somehow. Like, right? The kid gives it to her. This is a postcard that was sent to Sarah Duncan from the Charles Marshall family when they're on vacation. Um, Allison, where is this again? Glacier? Oh, oh Glacier. Um, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, somewhere where there, was, somewhere there was a glacier. Uh, some, glacier. Something to do with glacier. Glacier National Park. Right? Glacier. And so they send this. This is the back of the postcard. right? So they're thinking, this family, this prominent wealthy family is thinking of Sarah Duncan when they're on vacation and sending her a postcard back in Millbrook saying we're having a great time, the guy in front is our guide, right, here we are at the upper glacier. So it gives you a sense of maybe their, their relationship, you know, not just the servant, but maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, just with the right letter to it. Yeah, the right letter, yeah. I have no memory of why I included this one. <laughs> This is the one that it's stuck on. There we go. All right, I like this one. This is from one of the Marshall children, right? Ursula Marshall. Look how her name is spelled. Sarah ha Duncan, S-A-R-H-A. I think Ursula Marshall is about nine when she sends this. She actually dies when she's 17, which makes this a little bit more poignant. But she's writing this, right, to someone who works for her family. I hope you have a happy Christmas, right, from your little friend. A sweet little friend. Um, when was this postcard from? Before, Before 1907, Before right, exactly, because it's just the address written on one side. This is another family that she worked for, and notice, right, she's, she's getting mail, not just care of this family in Millbrook, she's getting mail, care of this family, 19 East 62nd Street in New York City, right? So at least at some point, like, she's down there in the city, right, staying with them, working with them. Roswell Miller is... He had a house, Caradoc, um, on Nine Partners. Um, his son married the daughter of Andrew Carnegie. Oh. Right? And so, if you notice, right, these two families, Marshall and Miller, they live a half mile away from each other, basically on Nine Partners and around the corner. And they both live on East 62nd Street in New York City. 
And so, and I don't have any evidence that they were like, you know, bosom buddies or anything like that, but it seems more than a coincidence. She's working for both families. Right, here she is getting mail, right, 19 East 62nd Street from her granddaughter. Another piece of mail, East 62nd Street. And here's one that's interesting, right? It's in German, but 19 East 62nd Street. So I'm going to assume that this person is a German servant working in the home who gives her postcard that she gets from somebody to her co-worker. Okay, so the other day, I was going to a Mets game, and I thought, well, I'm just going to walk like 20 blocks up from Grand Central and see if these houses are still there, 19 and 137. And I have no reason to believe that like the house numbering system is the same as it was. I don't really know that that's true. Um, but I found a couple places. Sadly, this is 135, and so this would be 137. It's now a hamburger restaurant. And so that building is not there. That would have been the Marshall Townhouse. This one is 19. I am not 100% sure that that building is old enough, right, to have been there like in the first decade of the 20th century, but there is kind of a skinny little townhouse that's there. But the thing that I was not expecting, right in between these two houses, 30 oh. East 62nd Street, is where Teddy Roosevelt lived before he was president, right, Back before he was governor of New York. And so, again, the dates don't line up perfectly here, and I have no, like, evidence to support this, but I like to think that, like, Sarah Duncan was walking on East 62nd Street and, you know, doing some kind of errand for her employers, and, like, Teddy Roosevelt came barreling down the street and probably, like, you know, knocked into her and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> All right, really quickly, I just want to show you some of the pictures uh, from the collection. This is the house, obviously, right? Snowstorm. This is kind of a cool picture. This is Sarah Duncan's son, Sanford. We saw his grave in Nine Partners. Mm -hmm. This is Amos Anthony. Kind of a cool picture. Mm -hmm. It's very large. A couple of baseball players, random baseball players. I have no idea why they're there. Huh. Guy on the left, I think, is in the Hall of Fame. A picture of Mae Bennett, right? Founder of Bennett School. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know why they had that. I don't know how she got the postcards from students at Bennett. Maybe she did work there as well. This is a girl that I think Evelina Anthony babysat. And I just show this because maybe three years ago, this woman came to the Historical Society archives and donated a bunch of stuff about her family. And she was like in her 80s at that point. And then this is labeled on the back. I'm like, oh, that name sounds familiar. So I met that person. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, this was the wreath that the Marshall family sent um, for Sarah Duncan's funeral. So again, maybe some indication that the relationship was fairly close. Uh, one of the daughters of Amos and Evelina, kind of formal portrait. Um, I wish uh, Marion was here, the woman I mentioned before, right, who's 97. Um, this is, I think, my favorite photograph. It's just a beautiful photograph. Like, the composition of this is really lovely. I think the kid in the middle is Marion's husband. Um, Prescott. Uh, Preston. Preston. Preston, Preston right? Yeah. Was, I don't know, three there or something? Yeah. Um, this is, the guy on the right in both these is Marion's husband as well, right? As a teenager. Here he is, the Millbrook High School basketball team. Again, so they have these pictures of people like these even aren't these aren't family members. These are like you know friends and acquaintances. Right? That's Jack Anthony who served in World War II. There's a, a bunch of material about his service in the war. Here's the gazebo. Shout out for the gazebo, right? Trying to restore. <laughs> Where's this? Tribute Garden. Tribute Garden. Bridge the Tribute Garden. So that is the great grandson of Sarah Anthony. This may be the person who like sold you your house 20, 25 years ago, whatever that was. Is it the one with Dennis? That might be it's either Dennis or Roger. It's one of the two brothers. I'm not sure which one. Um, this is like from their front porch, and I just show this because you can see the, the old bridge, right, that used to cross the creek there, kind of like near where David and Ann live. In the back. 
photographs of the daughters there posing in front of the house. And this is the last one I'll show you. This is um, what we used for the, the mailing. Um, I just really love this photograph. Um, I love the lighting of it, composition of it. Um, that's Amos and, and Evelina, the front, punch, the front porch of that house that like, plays such a central role um, in this story and, and how it came into the hands of the historical society. Yeah. Um, so I will stop there. Like I said, I, I got like, I cut this down by like 30 slides. So <laughs> could have been, um, but if people have questions, um, I know we went a little long here. Um, I'd be happy to try to answer them or questions for uh, recorded about what's in the house. Um, anything you guys want to? So Dennis is still alive, the man who they bought the house from is still alive? I don't know that. So his name is Dennis King, okay. which is a really common name. He grew up in Hackensack, which makes it a little bit harder because it's a pretty large city. Tried to track that down. His brother died young. His brother died like in the 70s. Like, he was really young. It's possible Dennis is still alive. He would be probably in his 70s yeah, now. Yeah. So, yeah. He could answer a lot of your questions if could just He could answer, yeah. Because, I mean, he, so, like, he grew up in Hackensack, but they would come up in the summer um, and visit their grandparents and hang out at the house. I mean, there are definitely people in Millbrook who remember, like, you know, playing with them when they were kids in the, in the 50s or so. Questions? This was too comprehensive, right? You have no. <laughs> okay, well, we have books. Cookies, and there's a reminder that if you want to help with the uh, walking tour, we talked about it before, um, we have the sign up sheet going around. Oh, and Allison in the back there has binders. One of the other things that they kept was a whole bunch of newspaper clippings. You get a sense of like what kind of stories they cared about. Um, and so you can flip through that stuff if you want and take a look, right? Allison has them in the back. Yeah. This um, is 